Please welcome David Schwartz. <laughs> Concert tickets, right? That doesn't make very much sense. But for things that are fungible, 
Um, these Azure assets provide a very nice interface. They've been used for everything from stable coins, ounces of gold, and even in one case, silver dimes. One of the very first gateways that we had was the silver dime gateway. There was a guy who had a whole bunch of silver dimes, and they're roughly worth their silver value because there's lots and lots of these, uh, these dimes. And so you could send him cash or silver dimes, and he would issue you an asset on the ledger, and you could redeem that asset with him, and he would mail you silver dimes. And I still have in my desk drawer a little vial of silver dimes that are in my hands because of hexaphone ledger transactions that occurred in the very, very earliest days of the ledger. So it's that decentralized asset exchange, that ability to swap. I bought those silver dimes with XRP by swapping so many units of XRP for some number of units of this asset denominated in silver dimes in 2012. So that was the world's first decentralized asset exchange. A major XRP ledger feature is this decentralized asset exchange integrated into a payment engine that supports cross-currency and cross-asset payments. This is an extremely sophisticated payment engine. Anybody who's developed one can tell you it's incredibly complex. But the reason for that is to provide this seamless experience where you don't have to think about what asset you're holding and what asset somebody wants to pay. It just works. A year ago, Ripple had a developer demo day that was just purely internal. It was just for our employees to show other people at the company what they had developed. And I, should, I demonstrated the payment engine on the XRP ledger. So I logged into an XRP ledger account, and I typed in another account, right? And I said, I want to send them one Bitcoin. And it said, you can do that with this many XRP, this many euros, this many US dollars, because I had all of those balances in the account. This was live on the real ledger. And I could push any one of those currencies, and the prices would change in real time as the DEX exchange rates changed. And afterwards, people were so impressed by this demonstration that that cross-currency payment flow was so smooth. They're like, what software is this? What have you just shown us? Remember, this was a year ago. And I said, this is the first XRP Ledger wallet from 2014. So this is technology that was seven years old using the Dex that was built in 2012. And it still, to this day, is something that the conventional financial system can only, can only provide to like the highest level enterprise customers. It is virtually impossible any one of the conventional financial systems for you to hold multiple balances in multiple different currencies and then be able to make a seamless payment paying from the asset of your choice to the asset of your choice. And if you did get that, the fees would be astronomical. So this is, this is functionality that you just can't find in other places. It's just, it just works. And the prices, again, the rates are incredibly cheap. Invariant checking is something that I'm very proud of. Um, Mostly came from a man named Nick Mugala, so I'm sure many of you have heard of. Great developer, great friend of mine, lives in Las Vegas. Um, and what it does is it allows many kinds of very serious bugs to be caught without corrupting the public ledger. So if you could imagine hypothetically, let's say there was some bug in the XRP ledger software that allowed somebody to create XRP. I mean, it's hard to imagine a worse bug, right? And that could happen. There's thousands and thousands of lines of code in the XRP ledger. Who knows, somewhere in a payment transaction or an account set transaction, there could be a bug that could allow somebody to create XRP. But we bought it, other people have bought it, we hope there isn't. But you're talking about tens or hundreds of thousands of lines of code. It's very hard to be confident. And that code is changing. XLS 20D adds functionality. Could it add a bug that creates XRP? We certainly hope not. We've looked very hard. But the problem is like, if, I, if you tell me, if you ask me, like, how do I know there's no bug like that? And I say, well, go look through these hundreds of thousands of lines of code and you won't find a bug. If you do, let me know, please. Right? That's, that's a deeply unsatisfying answer, right? And that's how many blockchains work. That's how the DAO attack worked, right? The DAO, you guys remember, that there was one of the first DAOs on the, on the Ethereum blockchain. It was called the DAO because it was the first DAO. And it got attacked by someone who found a way to cause the DAO code to do things that people didn't want it to do. And that code was audited, and the auditors missed it because they're human. What invariant checking does is it's a very small piece of code. It's a tiny piece of code that you could realistically audit, right? If I said, here's the 150 lines of code that says thou shalt not create XRP, you could actually audit them, that, those lines of code. And we don't change them unless we have really good reason to. And what they do is they look at the consequences of a transaction. So let's say, you said, let's say hypothetically, bug in XLS 20D, some NFT transaction can create XRP. We certainly hope that's not true, it shouldn't be true. But you know, who knows, we're humans, we make mistakes. 
After that transaction executed, but before it was applied to the public ledger, the invariant checker will count how much XRP was created by the transaction and how much was destroyed. And there can be some, because a payment that moves XRP from one place to another effectively destroys the XRP at the source and creates XRP at the destination as far as like the math looks. And so you add it all up and you say, did this transaction leave more XRP in the ledger after than before? And if it did, the invariant checker throws that away. It just throws the transaction results away and it puts an indelible mark in the ledger that says, hey, there was a transaction here that found a way to create XRP. And that XRP never gets created and the public ledger never gets damaged. And this is, a, a, this, is, this is really massive because it provides a very high level of assurance that, that these very, very serious bugs can't corrupt the public ledger. Because corruption in the public ledger is a very painful thing to fix. Um, going back to the early days of Bitcoin, I think it was 2013, there was a bug that corrupted the Bitcoin blockchain that allowed people to create Bitcoin. And it went unchecked for a number of blocks. And of course, there's all this Bitcoin all over the place that shouldn't exist in the first place, and there's more Bitcoin than there should be. And in practice, really about the only thing you can do is everybody agree to rewind to a point in the past. Which, could you imagine undoing a day of Bitcoin transactions, like how disruptive that would be to exchanges? So, so I, I'm extremely pleased and extremely proud of that invariant checking. Lastly, the things that I'm going to highlight today is, is uh, repeatable accounts. Accounts are real things on the XRP ledger. They have balances, they have owners, they have properties that can be changed. This is unlike UTXOs on the Bitcoin blockchain that don't have properties. Well, uh, UTXO has a balance and it has some key that can sort of unlock it most of the time, but that's the end of its properties. So imagine if you're a charity or even a large company, you have an account on the ledger, you receive funds into that account, and there's somebody in your company who, or some process in your company that processes this, but that you know, can allow those transactions to be signed to access your funds. So say you're a charity and you just want US dollars. So you hire somebody to take all the donations that you've received and somehow turn them into US dollars in your bank account. Now let's say at some point in the future you change your mind and say, okay, now we want to hold XRP, we want to hold Bitcoin. We don't want to convert them into dollars immediately. So you fire the person or the company that was doing it, or maybe the employee leaves. In blockchains like Bitcoin, you have to change your receiving address at this point because there's no other way to change the key. There's no other way to lock out the company that had access to your account before. That's very disruptive, particularly for charities that have public, well-known addresses, right? There's a donation address for, let's say, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, you know, your favorite charity. They have to change those receiving addresses. That's very disruptive. So the XRP ledger has accounts as things that have properties. So what's been going on this year? I mean, it's been, it, it's just been incredible. It's just been incredible, the pace of development in the game. You guys give yourselves a hand. So. We provide tools, services, and so on. We're one contributor to the global and growing development and evolution of the XRP Ledger. And it has just been amazing to be part of this community. It, it has just been the most fantastic experience. I, think for, I, I speak for everyone, everybody at Ripple. It's just been amazing working with everyone. We're, we've been focused on new native capabilities. We've been focused on sort of the periphery around the Ledger. And we've been focused on making the XRP Ledger easier to use for developers. The developer community, even you know, in the past year, 2022, the growth has just been incredible. Just comparing Apex this year, if you were here last year, most of you weren't. You know, the, the growth is just amazing. And I think awareness of the XRP ledger as a layer one option has been increasing. Those speeds, fees, scalability, low energy uses, and I think the track record, 10 years running, and the built in DAX, tokenization, source of The XRP Ledger rises to the fore as a core opportunity differentiated against other chains with these features. 
So I guess I have to name a few of them. The big one that's on everybody's mind today is XLS 20D. Woo! Yeah. Yeah. I know there's a lot of people here who contributed to that effort, and, and, I, and I just want to say that again, it's a testament to the study of the community that is not the we, we know so little about, and then we try, I mean, but the space is so rapidly changing, and we don't know what, we know what people are doing, but what we don't know is what people aren't doing because the tools and technologies they need to do it aren't there. And it doesn't do us any good to build the tools to let people do the things they're already doing because they obviously already have them or they wouldn't be doing it, right? So like, we need people to tell us, what are you not doing? What do you need? And so that community feedback, we guessed at what we thought people needed, and sometimes we were right, and sometimes we were wrong, because, you know, we can only tell what people are doing. So that community feedback was fantastic. We had explosive interest from developers in building around NFT projects, and um, developers at Ripple proposed to build native support for NFTs with that feedback from the community. So we introduced the XLS 20D specification in the first quarter. Now, as many of you probably know, weeks away we found a way to make NFTs without XLS 20D support um, with using the issued assets. And it's it's amazing. I mean, it's a, it's a fantastic engineering feat because people would have said that like there's no way to do it. Um, we found a way to do it, but you know, it's using thrust to make a big fly. It's very impressive that you can make a big fly, but we don't take picks across the country for very good reasons, right? So not to take away from that, that was amazing, but it, it, it was not the scalable solution that we needed. And I think that sort of lit fire under a lot of people to say, well, we need to come up with a, a correct, a proper way to do this, a way that fits with the, you know, the XRP ledger philosophy. So he added native NFT, uh, XLS 20D adds native NFT object support with functions like minting, burning, trading, royalties, a URI for metadata, and critically, an efficient storage mechanism. So there wasn't anything in the XRP ledger previously that you needed to store a lot of. And for an NFT proposal, you really want people to be able to store a lot of them in some kind of an efficient way. Um, and so we developed a pages mechanism, which sort of compresses the ledger storage space so that you can have a large number of NFTs without creating that kind of feedback. Um, the proposal was perfected with the feedback from the community. Uh, we got suggestions from GitHub. Many of you spoke to us directly. Then again, that was, in, that was that was, that was probably the first time that I really felt like there was a development community. Like before patch, you know, patches trickled in, well, hooks I'll talk about later, I mean that, obviously. You know, but this was the first case where we really experienced directly of that sort of collaboration process that we, that we want, where, where something you know, was developed was sort of a back, and, a back and forth about the feature. So the amendment opened for voting in the second quarter, and, um, you know, I'm extremely excited. So, it enables, so like I said, it enables minting, trading, and burning. It has additional features like automatic royalties, co-ownership of assets, features that people told us they needed. Um, and it does not require smart contracts. So this is a, a, an advantage and a disadvantage, and I think there's like a significant sweet spot of use cases that XLS 20 targets. If you need a smart contract to do something weird and specific, if you want to have male and female NFTs that mate with each other on-chain, you can't do that with XLS 20D, but you need a smart contract to do that. You can do it off chain, but that's not necessarily the solution you want. But 80%, 90% of the use cases, we just need that basic functionality. And the advantage of not using smart contracts and instead having smart transactors is the cost is much lower. And I think another thing, we've recently seen people who've had NFTs stolen from them. And one of the mechanisms by which an NFT is stolen is the user is duped into authorizing the smart contract this functionality they don't understand. Smart contracts add a layer of risk to NFTs as they also add a layer of functionality. So by eliminating those smart contracts, yes, you do lose some of that functionality that some, you know, some, some use cases need. But for other use cases that need the functionality that's you know, minting, burning, holding, transferring, royalties, offers, that need that basic functionality, you don't have the, those are the risks associated with smart contracts like that. We do anticipate that there will be increased network activity as people use XLS 20D, load will go up. Uh, the 1.9.1 release contains significant effort by RippleX Engineering and others. Aimed at that, we conducted performance testing, and then we reached a point where we were confident to vote yes on the XLS 20D amendment. The validator community is now voting on the proposed amendment. As most of you probably know, there must be at least an 80% yes vote 
in order for an amendment to activate, and that has to be held for two weeks. So about a week ago, the amendment passed the 80% majority, so, and it's, it's now pretty close to 90%, so. gas and to help speed this long, but I also think that it is extremely important to acknowledge the people who voted no, and especially, and this is, this is like, why do we have this voting process? Well, one reason is to make sure that we're not enabling functionality that could, that could have bugs or could threaten the stability of the network. Blockchains are hard to change for very good reasons. Uh, Bitcoin, base of innovation in Bitcoin is very slow. And part of that is because it's very important to the community that they not break it, right? One of the things that people like about blockchains is this level of assurance that I'm pretty confident it's going to work next year as well as it works today. And we never want to break that. And I think when people say, no, I'm not convinced, I mean, if they're just being obstructionist, yeah, I mean, don't thank them for that. But I mean, if they are putting the effort in to make sure that we are taking the time, you know, it's annoying when we don't have functionality immediately, everybody wants like, I want it now, right? If you want it, you want it now. But it's critical that we not break, you know, a, a, a system that's handling billions of dollars worth of transactions, we don't want to break it. And we take that responsibility seriously, and, and we think that when, when the community takes that seriously, yeah, it's, it's a bit annoying, you know, we want to do things, but like, it's super critical. I think we should thank the people who looked at the proposal and said, hey, I have questions. You need to reassure me that, that this is good, that this is not going to break. We don't want to break the ledger for payments, right? Could you imagine if NFTs were fantastic if we broke payments? Like <laughs> that would be the worst victory ever, right? So I do want to take the time to thank the people who who, who said no for good reasons. And, and that's what we want, right? That's what we want. We want people who, who care and who take the time to make smart decisions. And yes, that does mean we can't, we can't always move as quickly as we want to. Project Clio has been a huge, <laughs> huge effort, started quite some time ago. The beta was finally released in the first half of this year. Uh, there were a lot of technical challenges, but it creates a massive storage reduction for servers that handle queries from clients. And that is critical to scaling the ledger. I think like we all understand that like people will talk about transaction per second limits of the consensus layer. And obviously the network can't go any faster than consensus can. But you can imagine a world where consensus could be ridiculously fast and then wallets can't keep up. Right? If, if your wallet doesn't work, from your point of view, the you know, except the ledger's down. And it doesn't matter if you know ledgers are closing every five seconds, they have fifty thousand transactions and the core is working fine. If, if the infrastructure around that can't keep up, then the system is unusable. And what Clio did is it created a new way to scale that sort of next layer around the XRP ledger by implementing the, the API, the, the software tool, uh, software interface that developers talk to, optimized for scalability and availability. Um, we run a cluster of servers that provide the functionality the XRPL Foundation does. Those servers will often handle 40,000 queries a second. So scaling them is extremely critical. Clio is a major effort in that regard. Clio stores ledger and transaction data in much less space than RippleD does. RippleD is designed to close ledgers quickly, to run transactions quickly, to reach consensus quickly, to publish ledgers quickly. It's not really designed for a wallet to ask questions like, you know, how much money do I have? How much will this transaction cost? Like, those types of queries about the state of the network um, shouldn't be competing for resources with things like consensus. And so Clio gives a much greater separation. So it removes the burden of handling those API requests from the software that's managing the consensus layer network. This will allow more users and more developers to reliably interact with the ledger and really help Ripple D process transact. Ripple D is what we call the uh, XRP ledger software. We need to rename that to XRP LD or something, but it's still Ripple D for your ideas. Names are hard to change. So that will help Ripple D trans process transactions more efficiently because it won't be constantly dealing with queries. It is so important that infrastructure be stable. If you interact with the XRP ledger through an exchange and your exchange's servers are unstable, you're gonna get a terrible experience, right? You're gonna, you're gonna make a deposit and it's gonna take a while. The ledger could process in six seconds, but if it takes the exchange two minutes because their internal processes are backed up, or a withdrawal takes 20 minutes because their internal processes are backed up, 
then your experience is still going to be bad. It's actually pretty funny in the early days. Um, we actually have exchanges who had to upgrade a lot of their internal processes because the ledger was so fast, right? If they take six blocks to confirm a Bitcoin transaction, which could be an hour, they don't have to process the queue every, every minute or every five minutes. They can process the queue every 15 minutes. And that produced a poor experience for XMP ledger users. So the stuff around the ledger has to be as good as the ledger, otherwise, you know, otherwise there's no benefit. So Project Leo is a major improvement in providing that large-scale access to the XRP ledger features for developers, wallets, exchanges, and all ledger users. Brings us to hugs. This, th this effort really, this was, I think, I think this is still the largest effort on the XRP ledger to date that Ripple had almost literally nothing to do with. Like, I think I mean, we had nothing to do with the concept formation, and um, it came completely from XRP Labs. They've also worked on things like um, adding escrow and payment channel support for issued assets, expanding the signer list, creating 32 sign signers, adding some metadata, all kinds of other things. But Hooks is in a class by itself. Hooks is a bespoke, light, smart contract solution for the XRP ledger. So it's complementary to an EVM sidechain. A, a, a sidechain that supports the Ethereum virtual machine will allow you to take Ethereum, you know, smart contracts designed for platforms like Ethereum and those that are compatible, and use them with minimal changes. It's very powerful, but it brings some of the disadvantages of those platforms in terms of the complexity and cost. Hooks is like built around the XRP Ledger's philosophy of smart transactors and of sort of light, efficient mechanisms that are cheap and that don't like have the resource consumption. Hooks cannot do everything that an EVM sidechain can do. But again, like I was saying with XLS 20D, it cuts out a significant fraction of the interesting use cases and provides better support for them than a more flexible solution that can be everything everyone can do because it's, fo it's more focused, it's more efficient, it's better designed to do what it's designed to do. So super, super excited about that. Um, so it fits with XRP Ledger's core design principles. And its feature set uh, covers many of the DeFi use cases. You cannot do everything you can do with the EVM side chain networks. It responds to transactions in a certain way. It's limited the capability of what it can do. But again, it cuts out a large subset of the interesting use cases and it, it, it enables them. So very, very excited about that. That could be enabled on the XRP Ledger main chain. Whereas like EVM smart contracts, if you enable those types of smart contracts on the main chain, you would lose the functionality of payments. Like cost would go up. Throughput would go down, and we would lose some of the, the things that make the XRP ledger great. So, you know, rather than having this great payments but no smart contract functionality at all, full smart contract functionality, but anybody use Ethereum for payments, right? You can't because the speed is so low and the cost is so high. So, this gives us a nice middle ground that gives us, you know, for, for a significant set of interesting use cases, it gives us a solution. Now, something near and dear to my heart the automated market maker specification. I almost said automated money maker, which actually is kind of So, the XRP ledger is a leading enabler of DeFi with features like the DEX and payments because of the design of the protocol. And one thing that we have not had, the traditionally most, you know, I think 90% 90, 90 of DEXs have automated market makers, they're built around it. The XRP ledger's DEX is built around the simple, uh, central limit order book rather than an automated market maker. But I think if you have both of them, I think this is a case where and is, it just blows away for The automated market maker addresses most of the pain points that people face in the decentralized liquidity landscape today. So the DEX launched in 2012. It allowed tokenization of any kind of asset and the ability to trade and move them in just seconds on chain. It provided like globally competitive liquidity, but there was no way to get yield and sometimes there just wasn't the sort of liquidity that people might need. So Ripple X focused on differentiating our DAX with automated market making in conjunction with the central limit order book and integrated with payments so that these three features work together to provide a feature set that is unmatched. This is not everybody else has automated market makers, now we have them too. This is everybody else had automated market makers because they couldn't build an order book. Imagine an order book on Ethereum. If you think about how order books work, as prices change, people place offers at different rates. They cancel previous offers. If it costs you 13 bucks to place an offer that nobody's likely to take, just to provide liquidity in case someone needs it, that's completely untenable. If your transaction takes 10 minutes to confirm, you can't track price changes. We have this own order book because we can, 
and the functionality of both of them together is just, it, I, I can't, I, I don't have words to convey how excited I am for this feature. In October, we're very hopeful that developers will be able to use and test an early version on the developer network so people can build front end new APIs, integrate with new applications, and understand the features that it can provide. I would love to do the whole talk on the automated market maker and get really deep in the weeds, and I'm going to have to fight myself not to get very technical because it, it, this is sort of engineering perfection that certain things have. Any, anyone who has worked on something, it doesn't have to be software, it can be cars, it can be bicycles, but anything where you're building something, you reach a point where like everything works together and it just fits really nice, and you're like, yes, this is like, like really nice. And then there will be a couple boards somewhere, but they really stand out because the rest of the design is so great. And, and we're reaching that point. So I want to talk about what makes this so amazing to me. And I will try not to get too deep in the weeds, but if we get me started after talking about this, we'll probably have to like smack you to get me to shut up. So I'm almost not, I'm almost not kidding. So people have provided equipment to the automated market maker. So the automated market maker, in order to trade, it needs assets to trade with. And so people have to sort of loan in assets. They put the assets in the automated market maker's pools. And they get back liquidity tokens. These are tokens issued assets that are tradable on the DEX that represent their proportional ownership. So these tokens can be traded on the DEX, you can hold them. You don't have to cash them into the cash them in for your share of pools if you want. You can just you can just sort of move them around and use them as an asset. And for US holders, this should be very tax efficient. Your gains won't be realized until you sell or dispose of the liquidity token. So if you put a bunch of XRP and a bunch of Bitcoin in a liquidity pool for an AMM, you'll get back some liquidity tokens, which you can just hold. The AMM will do its thing, hopefully producing return for you, and then you can sell those liquidity tokens when you're done, and then that will be a if you're in the US, that's a taxable event, but your money grows and grow tax free. Obviously not tax advice, you know, consult with experts, but I think we got it. The, one of the other cool features secret sauces is this continuous auction mechanism, which auctions off the right to arbitrage against the automated market maker. So this is something that's completely unique, not available anywhere else. The automated market maker um, arbitragers will trade against the automated market maker when its pricing is wrong. So the automated market maker doesn't know what the prices are, right? It, it doesn't have an oracle. It's completely automated and algorithmic. And so its prices can become wrong with the external price action, right? The price of Bitcoin goes up, the price of XRP goes down, the price of things change. And arbitragers will trade against it and they'll make a profit. What the automated market maker does is the arbitrage world is fiercely competitive, right? If you're an arbitrage and there's an arbitrage right next to you. If you have a trade that makes you a dollar, you have to think, do I make this trade to make a dollar, or do I wait until maybe I'll make two, three, or five dollars? But if you wait too long, somebody else is gonna snap it up before you. We want arbitragers to work quicker. We want arbitragers, we don't want arbitragers to leave the pool suffer such large losses. So what we did is we gave a designated arbitrager who pays a fee for this, execution privileges that will allow them to arbitrage more rapidly than anybody else would. And if they're diligent, they should be able to capture a significant fraction of the arbitrage opportunity. Because the pool sells this privilege, it should reap as its own profit a significant fraction of what the arbitrage would make. So say you can make $100 a day arbitrage against the pool, and I can make $100 a day arbitrage against that same pool. We'll compete, right? We'll bid for that, and maybe I'll bid you know, $90. And now the pool just made $90, and I only made $10 instead of the pool losing $100 and making it. So the pool charges for arbitrage rights, and it does it using its own liquidity tokens as the currency by which you buy these arbitrage slots, and it destroys them when they're paid to the pool. So arbitragers who want those arbitrage slots have to acquire liquidity tokens, either by putting money into the pool or buying it from other people, and then they, they're destroyed. And if there are fewer liquidity tokens outstanding, the value of each one goes up because it's a claim against the assets. Now, another thing that happens is volatility. So external prices change, right? The price of XRP changes, the price of Bitcoin changes. That means the value of the assets the pool holds changes. And that drives up both arbitrage activity. There's only an opportunity to arbitrage if the price is out of whack. One source of the price being out of whack could be changes in the price. But also natural ledger activity. People make the payments and offers. All of these things trade against the AMM instance, and the AMM makes a spread. But there's something else going on that's almost more exciting, which is volatility is harvested by the automated market maker. 
Normally, volatility just results in risk and a reduction in yield. But here, it's a gain in yield. The automated market maker actually implements a trading strategy that converts volatility into yield. I could go on for a very long time about that, but I'm not going to because it's going to take us way in the weeds. But if you see me, again, if you see me outside, trading strategies are something that I'm very, very interested in. If you think about what an automated market maker does, when the price goes up, it sells, and when the price goes down, it buys. That strategy, you can imagine if you hold out the stock and the price goes up and you sell and then the price goes back down and you buy, you make a profit. The price goes down and you buy and the price goes back up, you make a profit. You sell, you make a profit. That's what an automated market maker does all day long. In addition, the automated market maker leverages the XRP ledger's inherent advantages. The XRP ledger has very, very fast transactions. The XRP ledger has very, very low transaction costs. These are things that will drive up the revenue and the efficiency of the automated market maker. So if the price of XRP goes up or down, and then it comes back in just a few seconds, if you were on a blockchain like Ethereum, there's no way that you can harvest that volatility because your transactions take several minutes to confirm. There's just no way that you can make that work. But because it is so fast, the trading algorithm can convert yield, uh, convert volatility into yield much, much more rapidly. Higher transaction fees mean that arbitragers wait to transact. If the transaction fee is $13 and you're only going to make $10, you don't submit the transaction. Like you have no choice but to wait. But because the transaction fees are so low on the XRP ledger and the transactions are so fast, that means arbitraging is going to be more efficient and the pool is going to be able to capture more volatility for yield. XRP has low transaction fees, high transaction fees make arbitraging so much more competitive and so much faster that it reduces the pool's arbitrage losses and increases the pool's volatility gain. Lastly, the XRP ledger doesn't have block producers. Block producers, if you know what, anybody know what MEV is? So these are block producers who are finding ways to essentially front run. It would be illegal anywhere else, right? Miners, stakers, block producers, whatever you call them, can front run AMM transactions. But you can't do that on the XRP ledger because there aren't miners, stakers, or block producers. The consensus process doesn't allow any party to be the dictator of the moment to run the block. This makes arbitrage stocks more valuable and should increase the returns on the continuous auctions, resulting in more liquidity token destruction and more yield. One of the disadvantages of holding assets like XRP and Bitcoin is their volatility. I right, finally have stablecoin because volatile assets are like hard to hold and use. I'm hopeful that this combination of features in the AMM specification will turn that disadvantage into a significant advantage. AMMs will harvest volatility for yield. Volatility will drive market makers, which the AMM makes a spread right. If the price of Bitcoin stays at $20,000, eventually everybody who wants to buy at $20,000 is bought and everybody wants to sell at $20,000 is sold. It takes a movement in price to really drive that volume. And of course, volatility increases arbitrage of profits because the AMM gets more out of balance more, and the AMM gets a cut of those profits to the auction mechanism. So this could really turn the volatility of a digital asset from a downside to an upside. Super excited about it. Um, there's been a redesign of side chains. Um, we can't put all the DeFi functionality we'd like to have in the XRP Ledger main chain. We would lose its capacity to provide great payments. Cannot do it. So in the next half of the year, we're going to be focusing on side chains to allow people to build fully functional dApps and have VBM compatible side chain. Will allow assets to move, and this will provide a good list of advantages. One of the important ones is horizontal <laughs> scalability. The X, however many transactions we make the XRP ledger be able to do, that's how many transactions per second it's going to be able to do. And people are always going to want more. And with side chains, you can create additional ledgers or additional chains that have their own transaction per second limits. And so you get that horizontal scalability, right? In almost any other space, if you want more capacity, you fire up another server, you get double the capacity, you fire up another one, you get you know, another 30%. You can't do that on blockchains, right? You can't just fire up another XRP ledger instance and have another 1,500 transactions per second or something. So side chains will give us that capability. It will allow assets to move from chain to chain so you can have premium assets. If you really like Ethereum as your asset, asset, but you want the XRP ledger smart transactors, you can have that. Whatever combination of features you want, you can have. The obvious one is having XRP on an EVM compatible chain, but like that, that's like the one that most people would think of. But there are maybe people who want the reverse, right? They want really, you want really great payments with ETH or really great fast cheap payments with Bitcoin. You want the XRP ledger's mechanics, but maybe you want these other assets. And so this gives you that combination. 
which allows people to innovate at the blockchain level. Like the great thing about Ethereum is you can innovate at the smart contract level, but you're stuck with the layer one parameters that, you, that they have. You, you get what you get. And if you don't like those, tough. You want more storage space, tough, right? But this will allow people to innovate at the blockchain level. And it will also allow features like hooks or other features to be tested with real assets. And so they can make a case for adoption on the XRP ledger. As I was saying before, we don't want to break the ledger. What better way to prove that something is safe than to run it on a live blockchain with live assets and show that it works? The sidechains will let people do that. Let's talk about some of the innovations done at Ripple. We've been working mostly on safe time reduction to reduce the time it takes to start an XRP ledger node up. We're now down to less than two minutes in cases where the servers only lost sync for about 256 ledgers. We've drastically improved status reporting. Memory usage reduction in AV from our nodes know what we've done. We've reduced memory consumption by more than 15%, which is extremely important to allow a sort of diverse ecosystem of nodes operating. If you run nodes hosted on cloud computing, memory is really expensive, like much more expensive than almost any other resource. So bringing down that memory consumption is critical. Forward ledger replay has been a huge effort for us. It's the nature of the XRP ledger's consensus algorithm that a very small number of servers occasionally lose synchronization with the network because of how fast it operates and because it doesn't make absolute certainty that everyone agrees before making tentative forward progress. Um, so we want to reduce the node operating cost by reducing the need for resources to sort of catch up when the server goes out of sync and take the pressure off the network. Because if the server is out of sync, it puts more pressure on the rest of the network. They have to help it get back into sync, and then it can't provide services to anyone. So we've made a, a significant effort in this feature called Forward Ledger Replay. I won't go into the technical details. It also improves security against certain very rare attacks. Huge feature, huge progress this year. We put all of this effort into performance and scalability, reducing the cost to operate a node, helping to push decentralization further out. We want people to run their own nodes and improving the network stability and reliability. XRPL Labs made the signer increase amendment to increase the number of signers um, from 8 to 32 and allow metadata to be attached to those, those entries. This is extremely helpful for like enterprises, but it's also uh, really useful uh, for DeFi applications, where you may have like a consortium of nodes that have to sign a transaction and use these M of N arrangements, and having that maximum N go up from 8 to 32 natively makes those things work a little better. So, I always hate when people ask me to predict the future. I don't know what's going to happen. Hopefully the AMM solution is going to be deployed. You know, um, we're going to see more enterprise DeFi applications, but we need you guys to build the future. We need you to tell us what you need. We need you to build things. XLS 20 DC, uh, 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 is imminent. So, you know, I'm not, I, everybody always asks me to look at my crystal ball. We're gonna have NFTs, we're gonna have the AMM, we're gonna have hooks, it's gonna get faster. Can't tell you anything else. I know everybody wants me to. So here are some links, the XRPL Foundation, the XRPL Viewer, and a link for XRPL Grants. We need you. Thank you.